Okay, so Ben Sir Sashem, what we're looking at, we're looking at Masech um, HaShabbos, Daf Lamed Gezim, Lamed Gimel Lamed Beis. So we're going to talk about Rashbi, the Giloy of Rashbi, where Rashbi comes from. The reason that I wanted to focus on this Gemara is because what we saw last time was Rabbi Akiva. We saw the Torah of Rabbi Akiva. We saw Rabbi Akiva's relationship to Moshe Rabbeinu. And we know that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was one of the main Talmidim of Rabbi Akiva. And there's a way... <coughs> of learning Shas, not only learning Shas, but learning about the Tanayim, learning about who the Tanayim were and, and what their Shitos were and what the Mahalchim and Tanayim were. So there's a reason that this Gemara, which is about Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his encounter with the Ma'ara and running away and finding himself in a cave, and it's associated with the revelation of Panim Yisatara that came along with Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So before we go into the Gemara, we'll see. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was, was the initiator and the compiler of something called the Sefer HaZohar. Now the Zohar Kadosh is, is the holy book of the Jewish people after after Tarish Peh, after Tarish Shav. The Zohar Kadosh is a book that has kept the Jewish people surviving throughout generations and generations. Now the Giloy of the Zohar Kadosh was a Giloy that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was Megala specifically from within being stuck in the cave. Okay, the Zohar is the key text of Kabbalah. It's where the Arizal gets everything from. The Zohar Kadosh is the, the first Darga in Soda Satora. And so one would assume, or one can perhaps assume, that if it's associated with secrets of Torah, right? Secrets of Torah is something that is associated with loftiness, with elevation, with something supernal, with clarity, with the with the Midah of Shamayim, right? So the Satora is typically seen as malachim or things that are beyond the realm of this world. So one would assume that the transmission or the transition through which Sisrei Torah, the secrets of Torah, came into the world would be one of pomp and circumstance, you know, clarity and announcement and wealth and, and grandeur, or at least easy or, or simple, right? Someone is doing something so big as revealing the secrets of Torah, you would imagine perhaps that there was an element of ease that came with it. Torah Shabbat Peh, we understand, as the Medrash and Medrash Tanchum of Parshish Noach says, a person can't live in this world unless they kill themselves for Torah Shabbat Peh. And Torah Shabbat Peh, the Klala associated with Torah Shabbat Peh, that came as a result of Moshe Rabbeinu hitting the stone, of, instead of speaking to the Sela, is that to understand Torah Shabbat Peh demands Yegiya, and it demands Libun, and it demands Galus. Ad Kedekach, that Galus itself, Galus Matrayim, is described as Limbud HaGemara. Right, that be bechomer ulevenim zakta tekunei zayar bechomer da kav bechomer levenim da libun halacha. That the birur, the clarification of halacha, fine, I understand it has to come by way of pas be melech toichal and to be mahapech the yisurin of this world, the yisurin of Torah. But one would expect, at least one would assume or hope, that penimius of Torah would come about slightly easier. And ultimately, we don't see this. We see the very opposite. Whoever it was, whoever it was, whose hands or whose mouth the transmission of Sisrei Torah went throughout history, the, the process, the process, is that someone knocking on the door or no? I don't think so. Maybe it's someone knocking somewhere. The, the process in which, the process in which these teachings were revealed was through some preceding difficulty. There was something difficult that happened beforehand. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the first expression of this. And so what this Gemara is going to describe is the process in which Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai found himself in the cave, found himself in that place where he received Giloy Eliyahu, which was the beginning of the Sefer HaZohar. So famously, this Gemara is about Rabbi Shimon being chased from Malchus Roim, needing to run away because of Uchi of Misa, trying to hide, not finding a place to hide, finding a cave to hide in, with his son Rabbi Lazar Bray, and in that cave burying themselves up to their neck in sand, and the miracle of the Charuv and the Ma'ayan Hamayim that gave them life, and then Elio Anavi coming back and announcing it's time to leave, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai coming out and seeing a world that was not in alignment with the strict severity of the secrets of Torah, and destroying the world, so to speak, being sent back in, coming back out, the encounter with Rabbi Yitzhak Pinchas Ben Yair, sees him suffering, says, woe to me that I see you as such, and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai again affirms that, no, no, it's my suffering, it's Itself, that was the birthplace of Pnimi Yisatora. And Torah Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai goes to the town of Tiveria and purifies the, the suffix of Tumas Misa that they had there. So what we're going to try and do is we'll begin the Gemara and we'll move through, you know, it could take a week, it could take two weeks, whatever it is. And, um, and famously, you know, we've spoken about the, 
the omnisignificance of the text and the fact that certain agaratas, as Rav Tzadok said, are found in particular gemaras that are associated with that concept. Right? The agarata of a mesechta is not happenstance, but rather it's connected to that mesechta. There's something miyuchad. Right? We see that the agaratas of the churban are found in mesechas gitin. Why? Because just as gitin is a severing of a previous unity, just as gitin is a cutting away of something that was held together, so too the churban is a maisa gitin. And you see the, the agaratas of man. Right? Where do we see the agaratas of man? We see the agaratas of man in, in, in yoma. Why? Because on Yom Kippur, a person eats man. A person eats spirituality. It's not that a person is fasting or refraining from food. A person is partaking of spirituality. So you always find the agaratas associated with their Masechta. So why are we finding the Maisa of Rashbi and Masechta Shabbos? We're finding the Maisa. One Mahalach is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai himself is referred to as Shabbos. That the light of a tzaddik, the presence of a tzaddik, the presence of a pillar of fire through whom the revelation of Torah takes place is on a spiritual soul-oriented level the corresponding expression of Shabbos in time, right? We know that there's three frameworks in which reality is expressed. Oilam, Shana, and Nefesh, right? Ashan. Oilam means the reality in which that thing reveals itself historically in the world. The Shin means time, shana, the time or the space in which this was taking place and the nefesh is the who meaning the neshama through which this idea was taking place. So famously you have you have the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur in the Kodesh HaKadoshim. Oilam is Kodesh HaKadoshim. It's a space. The soul is the Kohen Gadol. The time is Kodesh HaKadoshim. So just as we have Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai in the world we have Meirom or Svas as a place, there's also the time of Shabbos. So uh, first and foremost, it's just the revelation of unity, specifically out of change. Like we said, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Gilui comes from within the cave itself. Furthermore, the Perek that we find ourselves in is Bamem Madlikin. So not only is it Shabbos, but it's Bamem Madlikin. As what's the Kesher between Rashbi and Bamem Madlikin? So it's a Dabar Pasha. The entire Indian of Rashbi is Or. It's the Or HaZohar, which is a shining light. The Maskilim Yaziru Kezoyar Harakia. And the bonfires, right? The, the Hadlakos that take place in Meiron through Megala that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was in Or Mufla Roimala, a profound level of light. So Avada, so the the Perek, that the Gemara of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is going to be found, which is specifically Mesech Shabbos, which is the concept of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's life, is Bameh Madlikin, meaning how do we illuminate ourselves? Not Bameh, this is what you can illuminate yourself with, but a question of Bameh Madlikin, how, how am I going to illuminate myself? And the answer is also contained. Bameh Madlikin, Bameh Madlikin, Bameh Madlikin. The Indian of Ma, the concept of Ma, the concept of Bameh Madlikin, the way a person is going to be illuminated is through the concept of ma. Anachnu ma, right? So when you read the pasuk, or, or when you read the question, bamem madlikin, that's the question, but that's also the answer. Bamem madlikin, the way that we elevate ourselves is through the encounter with ma. So we have the Gemara of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai being found in Masech Shabbos, which is the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. We find it being found in the parak of bamem madlikin, which is the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. Bamem madlikin, ma is... Adam, it's the gematry of Adam. Right? We say in the Pismon, Nasa Adam Nemor Bavurecha. The creation of man was said about you, Rabbi Shimon, because the tachlis of being a mensch is to be Megala Shemayim in the Aretz, and that's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did. So, Bameh, meaning the Indian of Adam, Nasa Adam Nemor Bavurecha, is the answer of how do we illuminate ourselves. What's the Meshach Zarashbi? To be an Adam, to be a person, to realize that it's through me that I have the capacity of being Mechaber Shemayim in Aretz. That was the radical Cheshpan that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai made. He said, you're telling me that Shamayim is going to determine what is going to happen for us down here, like the other Tanayim were saying, that La'asid, you know, the Torah is going to be Tishkach me B'nei Yisrael. There was a fissure there. There was a separation between Shamayim and Aretz. Ki'ilu, our efforts down here might not last because of something that's going to go on in some celestial way. Zat Rashbi, no. The Adam has the power of being Makasha Shamayim va'aretz. Loi Tishkach me Pizari. As long as I'm here, as long as I'm the Aretz, as long as my name is in the Aretz, Sadiqa the tzaddikim are in the land. So then, there's, it's not dependent on Shemayim anymore. Lo be Shemayim, it's up to me, and I, and and I can be poiter kol la oylem in hadin. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says I can handle it. Kedai lismo chalav. It was not the first expression of a tzaddik; it was the second one. The first was Moshe Rabbeinu. 
And Rashbi and Moshe are one and the same thing. It was Moshe who drew down the Nisham of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. As the Kamar Tzadikim point out, the Ramchal points out that Alisa Lamarom Shavisa Shevi Lakachos Matamos Mibnei Adam. What is Shevi? I ascended on high and I retrieved gifts. What Shevi? Shimon Bar Yochai. It's Rosh Teva Shimon Bar Yochai. It's also the Tevos of Yitzchak Ben Shlomo, which is the Arizal. It's also Yisrael Bal Shem, which is the Bal Shem Tov Akadosh. But the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was drawn down by Moshe Rabbeinu. But the Nasa Adam Nevor Baparecha is that I'm not I'm not going to be afraid of what Shemayim says right now. I'm going to say that the Torah is never going to be forgotten. So how do you illuminate yourself? Bamem Adlikin, in the aspect of being an Adam. It's also the, the Gematria 45, which is the Shem Havaya, as it's spelled out in the Miloy Alfin, which is the essential name that we have access to in, in the world of Atsilas, the world of Torah, that it's Yud, Vav, Dalid, Hey, Aleph, Vav, Aleph, Vav, Hey, Aleph is Gematria of Ma, which is a significant concept, obviously. But most significantly, most significantly, it's the question of Bittl. Ma Madlikim, Ma Anachnu, Ma Chayinu, Ma Chasteinu, Ma Tzivkaseinu, of Nachnu Ma. The entire Tachlis of Pnimiya Satora, the entire Tachlis of Neshama like Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the entire Tachlis of Shabbos, the entire answer to the question of Ma Madlikin is Anachnu Ma. Bittel, Bittel, and Od Bittel. The entire Torah of Pnimiya Satorah and the entire Torah of Torah's Moshe, our Regal Achas, is Bittel, is getting out of the way. It doesn't mean self abnegation it doesn't mean self-hate, it doesn't mean low self-esteem, it doesn't mean self-negation in an unhealthy pathological way. It means owning every element of myself but recognizing that I am a shliach of the Rabbonu Shalom. I am a shliach, and shliach shalom shal adam kamoso. This is not mine. That's Bittel. As Moshe Rabbeinu, Rabbi Nachman writes, that you want to know how big of an anav Moshe Rabbeinu was? You want to know what it means to understand the secret of anava? He was such an anav that he wrote, I am such an incredible anav. It was that recognition that my bittel does not negate my strengths, but rather my strengths reveal opportunities for me to be mafata myself to kuchabrihu of saying it's his. So that's the question of bamem madlikin. So again, as a haktama, we have Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai's Gemara, the Gilui of Sisrei Torah, coming in Masecha Shabbos, right, which is a light that comes after the six days of the week, which is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the light of Shabbos, as the Zohar says. It's in the parak of Bamem Madlikin, which is the question of how do we illuminate things. And this one is already a famous one because it's so clear that the daf of the Gemara that this is found on uh, is daf Lamed Gimel Amad Beis, which is the gematria of Lag, obviously Lag Ba'omer. So we have the gematria of the daf, which is Lag Ba'omer, which is the secret of Gal Enai Va'abita Niflos Mesarosecha. It's not Lag. The, the Chiddush of Lag Ba'omer, the 33rd day of the Omer, is that it's the same osios as Gal, because that was the entire Indian of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the same Indian of Moshe Rabbeinu, to be Magala things. I heard from my Rebbe of Weinberger once in a Shal Shudas Drasha that he gave in Eish Kodesh, and he said, after all is said and done, after all the words of Hasidus, after every Drasha that we've ever given here, you know, it all comes down to ultimately the stanza in Yedid Nefesh, where it's Higalena, the question of Higalena, of Giloy, of Giloy. And who did Rabbi Shimon learn this from? Rabbi Shimon learned this from, from Rabbi Akiva, who we discussed last time. So we have, you know, like the trifecta of the, the significance of this Gemara being found here. It's the secret of Rashbi and the Gilui of Pinim Yasatora, Mesecha Shabbos, Perak Bamem Adlikin, and Andaf Lam and Gimel. Before we go into the Gemara, because this Gemara is going to be a few weeks a little bit, again, what we started off with was the, the seemingly strange phenomenon that one would assume that Pinim Yasatora would be revealed by way of pomp and circumstance and strength and clarification and illumination. And we said, we understand Tarash Shabbat is deeply rooted in struggle, but Pinim Yisatora should come about by way of smoothness and ease. But what we find by Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is the very opposite. We find this by the Arizal also, we find this by the Hashem Tov, we find this by all Tzadikim. The Giloy of Pinim Yisatora came from where? It came from the, the hell, right? We see an identification of the Ma'ara with Gehenim. Eliyahu Hanavi says, go back in there for the time that a person is in Gehenim for. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is Zulchat to Sisrei Torah from within Gehenim itself, from within the Ma'ara, from within a Chi of Misa. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai could have basically, with the Chi of Misa on him, it was as if he was dead. 
Running away to the shul was the attempt to live in Gan Eden Ha'elyon where the Torah was revealed. But Nashim Daisim Kalos, which means that in the world of Malchus, a person can get mixed up, everything is difficult. So he had to run away with his son into the Ma'ara, burying himself up to his neck, the Chibut HaKever, the separation between the head and the body, the dis- disorientation. Awful, why, like, fire came out of his eyes when he the farmer? Well, we'll get to that. We'll get why. Vamemadlikin, meaning fire in particular. Right, sure, sure, sure. Meaning the Gehenna, meaning the, the, the any concept that we have of an Eish Shel Gehenna is, is again, like we spoke about in the Shira, we touched upon Gehenna. Gehenna is not Heedar, it's the, it's the driving, the darkness, the, the, the not darkness, the, the severity, the constriction is the driving force behind the Giloi. So the, the reason, just like Avram Avinu, we said, the, the way he came to behold the Rabbani Shalom in this world was by seeing a world on fire. Fire is both illuminative and it's also kind of destructive. So too, on, on Lag Ba'imer, we celebrate with fire. We're, we're recognizing, and, and Moshe Rabbeinu came to HaKadosh Baruch Hu through fire as well. As the tzaddikim say, that he saw destruction that wasn't destroying. He saw severity that wasn't necessarily so negative. What's the Kesher of Nashim Daisim Kalos? Nashim Daisim Kalos we'll get to. That's the Gemara over here. The reason he couldn't stay in the shul is because he was afraid that his wife would come and kind of give in to the Romans. And so he says, because Nashim Daisim Kalos, that there's a concept. And the Arizal is done on this. Nashim Daisim Kalos, the concept of Das, when it comes to the feminine quality within ourselves, is deficient in relationship to the concept of Das, or awareness that we have, with relation to the masculine expression within ourselves. I do not believe, at least the Pshat of the Gemara, or even the Amkas of the Gemara, is certainly not that, you know, women are going to talk about me, and, and they're not going to be able to to, to hold their mouths, right? It's being Megal design the, the deepest truth. Nashim Daisim Kalos is also what the Arizal describes as the Siba of the of the Gullus, Malchus, which is Nashim, and and the stuckness of Malchus, the Golos Hashkina, is because it's we're still not holding by the fullness of Das. The Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh describes that Gulas Mitzrayim was Gulas Adas, which means, again, as we learn from Chassidus and from the, everybody from Rashbi and on, from the Vilna Gon is on, that yes, there's a historic Gula, but that's dependent upon and rooted in the personal redemption that we experience on a cognitive and ontological cognitive way, where my mind is a real experience. And if I find the Rabbani Shalom in my mind, I can elevate the entire world. When I recognize Hashem is here, Hashem is Mamish here. Malchus is always considered to be in the Kefa. Malchus is always considered to be that which is without fulfillment, that which is devoid of content, uh, an external casing devoid of something internalized. This worldliness and its kind of gross physicality. To, why is Malchus connected to Nekeva? Yeah. Well, Nekeva in general, and again, right, with all of the, the sensibilities that it takes to kind of properly meander through, you know, thousands of words that were written by, by very holy tzaddikim and, and men, you know, so we have to obviously be sensitive on every level to what the tzaddikim meant, right? To, to, to think that the tzaddikim meant something heavy or dark or, or negative or angry or minimizing or untrue or unfair is, is, a, is a misunderstanding of the tzaddikim, right? It's a pshit lilam alikra. They were not coming to, to be marachik, el alikarev. They were not coming to create a draconian reality. Kedusha ta'ara avada, but nasham daisim kala. So when we say nekeva, it, it's, it's, a, it's receptive. There's a certain element of receptivity, of silence associated. Again, metaphors that many people will want to try and you know, overcome completely. Malchus itself is that. It's, it's, yeah, Malchus is, okay, so fine. So in, in relationship to the other nine spheros, it is receptivity, right? So, that, right, so, okay, so it's the last of the spheros contains absolutely nothing of itself other than all that fulfills it. And that becomes kind of the, the metaphor, but the Levana is also the waxing and the waning. The, but it's the, the silent femininity that exists within each and every personality of a willingness to kind of wait and accept. So there is this concept of Gu'ula Sadas, right? Mitzrayim is Gu'ula Sadas. But it wasn't full Gu'ula Sadas. It wasn't full Gu'ula Sadas. We're waiting for the full Gula Sadas. And until Das is fully redeemed and our knowledge and our awareness of God is so clarified that we know that Hashem is here, Hashem is there, Hashem is truly everywhere, right? And we know that that's a statement that a person can say and should say. So, so, then, so then Das is going to be Nishlam, right? Then Das is going to be Nishlam. And until then, Noshim Daisim Kalas. And that's what gave birth to kind of Rashbi's running and returning. But we're already skipping lines in the Gemara. So... I, I want to read one one 
Keta from Rav Kook, Schuseganaleinu. And again, we're, we're going to go slow with this. I don't even know how far we'll get in the Gemara. This will be kind of the next few shirim. But with regards to this Indian that it's Megala, Megala Amkus Mine Choyshech. Why is it that the Amkus of Torah, why is it that Sisri Torah come about in such a way that was heavy and difficult? Why is it that the Baal Shem Tov HaKadosh came from the darkness of the Ukrainian forest? Why is it that the Vilnagon came from a place surrounded by Machlokas? Why is it that Ramchal, right? Why was it that Ramchal was, was excommunicated? Why was it that Rambam was pushed away? Why was it that Rabbi Nachman was dealt with in such a way? Rav Menachem and Lumishkov, all of the tzaddikim whose Sisrei Torah came through, there was a correspondent darkness that kind of carried that light of Torah. The Arizal was in Mitzrayim. First and foremost, it was Yerushalayim, Moshe Rabbeinu, exactly. Moshe Rabbeinu had to come about from the, the Betan of the Nachash itself. The redemption had to come from the house of Paro itself. Rabbi Shimon comes through the cave. Why, why is it? And so I, I want to read something that Rav Kook wrote. Rav Kook was, was already in Eretz Yisrael, already in Eretz Yisrael. I believe he was still Rav in Yafo. I'm, I'm, you'll know the years. Many people will know the years. And, and then, at the outbreak of World War I, he had been on a fundraising trip of sorts, and he ended up stuck in London. He ended up stuck in London, and he was the Rav of, of Machzike Hadas. I believe, I mean, one of my favorite things, that Rav Kook's stay, where he stayed and where he wrote the Sefer Reish Milin, is about 25 minutes from where Rav Itchemai Morgenstern grew up. So I, I like to see that as some sort of significant thing. But, um, but Rav Kook, when he was in London... And at this point, I mean, there's books that are coming out now about Rav Kook by Smadar Sherlow and, and just about how at this time the letters between Rav Kook and Rav Yaakov Moshe Chalap, whose yard said it was this week, were not only like, they were deeply rooted in a deep, deep belief that, that Mashiach is, is ultimately rooted in Pini Torah coming out and in the neshama of, of these tzaddikim, which is certainly a true thing. It's rooted in the neshamas of all the tzaddikim. But, but Rav Kook was mamish, he was, he was not... Just Rav Kook, as we tend to know Rav Kook, Rav Kook was a Makubal Eliki. Rav Kook was, was an Eish Kodesh on the, on the level that the, the Sisrei Torah that he was being Mazbir were, were Chad B'minam. The Sefer that he wrote there is, is arguably the most difficult Sefer, as, as is said. The Sefer itself is considered a Segula, right? Rav Tzvi Yehuda would send Bachram out to, to army. To, to war with this sefer, there, there's a mashmaus. I heard that Rav Kook wanted to be buried with the sefer as well. It was the sefer Reish Milin. It was his commentary on the Osios, on the Aleph base. One of, I believe humbly, that it's 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 a hard sefer, but it is clearly the most, I, I believe, one of the most beautiful svarim of Rav Kook, if one could say such a thing. And it's also, I think, the clearest description of. The, the generalized overview of Rav Kook's Kabbalah, rooted very much in what we discussed last week, Rabbeinu, or a few weeks ago, Rabbeinu Azriel. But Rav Kook is writing here, why, why was it that when he was in Eretz Yisrael for those few years, he was now activated, like it was like tzaddik mode activated, and he went into talking about the most idealized visions of society, community, culture, nationalism, art, poetry, literature, all of it, all of it. And he began with this kind of nevuah that was coming from his chizayon, from his vision. And then when he comes, when he comes to, to London and is stuck during the war, his, his vision kind of descends into a very different place. He moves much more inwards. And so Rav Kook is addressing why is it now in this place of inwardness that he's deciding to write specifically the deepest sefer, the Medrash HaOsios, going into the Aleph base. So this is the first footnote that he writes. And it was really also expressed in a letter that he wrote to his son, Meaning this famous story that, that Rav, Rav Kook gave, gifted a copy of Reish Milin to, to Shaul Lieberman, who was a, a Yedid Nafsho of his, right? Shaul Lieberman, right? They, they were across the hall from each other at a certain point. And, and Shaul Lieberman records that at the moment that Rav Kook gave it, he, he had written, and Sholem has this written on his copy as well, in, in the library, is that, is that when, when the Rav gave me this book, he no longer remembered or understood what he had written in it. Meaning that Rav Kook had claimed, I don't, I, this is not, basically he was saying this is not mine. There's a segula to it. And in fact, Rav Ari Levine's son, uh, Rav Ari Levine's son, who was a Rav in London as well, who's connected to, to one of the Rabbanim in the community here, who's a, a grandson of him, who has writings actually, it's a strange story. Rav Ari Levine's son, 
Yaakov Avinu, I don't remember, tried to begin to write a commentary on Reish Milin, and he sent it to, to Rav Si Yehuda, and he sent it to Rav Kook. He sent it to Rav Kook, and Rav Kook said he understood the Kabbalah, uh, he understood the Kabbalah of it, but not the philosophy of it. So mice I heard from Ravari Levine's great grandson, who's a rav here in one of the in one of the shuls, um, he said that in truth the family had the, the family wanted to publish it, so they brought it to Rav Tzvi Yehuda, and Rav Tzvi Yehuda said you have to bring this to Lubavitcher Rebbe, you have to bring this to Lubavitcher Rebbe, which is amazing. But then they don't know what happened afterwards. But the fact that that was the answer that these stages have to go to the Baba Trevi first is amazing. So Rav Cook writes as follows, and this is again the, the building block to understand why Rashbi had to come through the cave first. When the world seems to operate in accordance with its natural flow, when there are no difficulties or upheavals in life, at that point, the the refined mind, the the ra'ayon ha'atzil, meaning the mind that's trying to grasp atzilus. That's what Rav Kook means, right? Yosef Avivi has proven this beyond the shadow of a doubt, that Rav Kook was speaking in the language of the Arizal, right? So when he says ra'ayon ha'atzili, ah, it's poetic, a refined soul. No, he means the mind that desires to access the darg of oilam ha'atzilus and to be mamshech, whatever they want to be mamshech, a person has the ability, l'kachas es parnasaso mehahestalkulis betinu asachayim. A person can satisfy, can, can support their vision by staring and gazing at that which is taking place throughout life, right? the general movements of life. The, the teachings in, in, inherent within kind of the study of social functioning, of, of nationalism, of, 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 uh, of the nationalism of Kedusha. And it's the qualities of any revealed form of knowledge. And a person can be certain and trust that when things are operating properly, I can draw down the spiritual sustenance that I so desperately need and seek from the outside world around me, from the makif and from culture. This is not the case in a time when life falls in to the concerning darkness that are filled with darkening evils and chaos. At that point, the revealed world begins to stutter. Its natural orders begin to kind of intertwine together. And if a person were to draw down the, the sustenance of life, of their own spirituality, from only the revealed element of this worldliness, there's going to be a profound impoverishment of the spirit that is ready waiting for him that is going to destroy his standing. That was where Rav Kook was rubbed there. Right? Therefore, as a defense mechanism, a spiritual defense mechanism in moments where the world is medaldeo, a person is filled again with the arrival of a deep burning thirst for the inner content of things, for the inside. El haskirut hapnimius shehen misnasois me'al ha'shetach ha'galu shebachayim. From the vision of internality that ascends and transcends, transcends the basic, you know, surface level that is revealed in life. Shebahem loy naga yad ha'muhum ha'olamis. The chaos and the hands of the world have not touched the sacred inner place. And from this place, a person is capable of going and drawing sustenance from the life-giving, joyous waters. To irrigate those dried-out bones of the externalized, revealed spiritual world. That has remained stuck in its darkness as a result of the impingement of these hands that have caused its life to to become confused. And for this specific reason, and it's this very impulse that drives me to write these following 
own words, Lirshoim es rishmei ha-machshava asher the medrash ha-osios, to trace the engravings of the mind when it comes to the medrash of the osios, dafka bizman hazes, specifically in this time. So, so again, Rav Kook is speaking for all tzaddikim, because Rav Kook was describing his inner experience, and he's speaking for that zerim of those who are makusher. And, and he's describing that it's not surprising or merely circumstantial that Panimiya Satora comes about after a darkness, but rather the darkness that precedes it is the very motivating engine behind the giloi of Panimiya Satora. That the struggle, in whatever level we're defining the struggle here, here it's the existential collapse of what Rav Kook understood, and also the distance away from his family in Eretz Yisrael, a real trauma, right? But it, it means whatever struggle a person goes through, it's the cave of one's life or one's moment, but that becomes the incubator, that becomes the driving force behind Niglo Satora. This is explained, there's an amazing, amazing teaching, it's a painful teaching, but Rav Al-Ghazi, um, I'm forgetting his name, um, Rav Ruven, uh, no, uh, Rav Al-Ghazi was one of the Tamidim of the Rashash, and he wrote a, a parish <coughs> called B'nai Aharon, B'nai Aharon on Shar HaGilgulim from the Arizal. Why? He was a Tamid of the Ben Ishchai. Why did he write a commentary, an amazing commentary? Not like the Roman Mipano wrote a commentary about this neshama, this neshama, this neshama, this. this. What, what the Bnei Aaron does is he shows how everything the Arizal is saying in Gilgulim is reflective of what the Arizal is saying in Olamos as well. It's the unity of the psychological and the spiritual. And so the reason, the, the Mavo, the reason that he wrote this commentary, it's, it's an unfathomable story. He had a number of children and he lost them. He was losing his children one after the other, Lo Aleinu. There was some plague going on. And, and, and he had one son left. He had one son left that he was mamish shakua nafshoin. And he's writing in the most poetic of ways about how he placed all of his hope in his son Aharon. This was the one thing that remained. And, and, and then Lo Aleinu, on, on the week of his wedding, he, he got sick and ultimately he passed away. This is this tzaddik writing about this trauma of losing his children one after the other and losing all hope. And he says in a very powerful way, I came running to my Rebbe, the Reach Tov, to, to the Ben Ishchai, and the only thing that gave me strength was to study the secrets of Gilgulim. The only thing that gave me strength was to descend into the Torah of life that survives death. So again, the incubator, the driving force behind the desire to descend into the depths of Torah is the difficulty that precedes it. And that's what we're going to be seeing in Daf Lamed Gimel, which is Gal, of Parak by Membad Likin, which is the question of how do we learn to illuminate, in the second Parak of Masech Shabbos, which is the world of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So we're going to enter a, a little bit into, into the text right now. So the question that we're beginning with, the question that we're beginning with is why is Rabbi Yehuda, why is Rabbi Yehuda referred to as Rosh HaMadabrim B'chol Makom? Generally speaking, when we have a number of Tanoim together, we find that it's Rabbi Yehuda. Now the Tzadikim explained that Yehuda, like we said, is very much associated with Malchus. Malchus Yehuda, Dabra Melech, right? Malchus is Peh, the Tikkun Torah tells us. It's written in Pesach Eliyahu, that Malchus Peh. That just as Malchus is not expressive of any of its own content, but rather a kli through which the inner content of thought and experience is transmitted towards the other, which is the value of speech and divor, so too the concept of Malchus is the receptacle through which the upper nine spheros reveal themselves so that they can be received. It's the presence of that expression down here. Rabbi Yehuda is Rosh Madabrim because he's the Darga of Dibor Bekdushaso. It was the Malchus. It was the ability to speak. And that's why it's Pasach Rabbi Yehuda. When we find that the Tanayim were Pasach, it means they're Pasach Piv. They open their mouths. This is why Rabbi Yehuda was about giving Simonim, Datsach Adash Ba'achav. Because for Rabbi Yehuda, it wasn't even speech did not need to be intelligible for it to be valuable. Speech could simply be hints. So that's the, the sugya of, of Rabbi Yehuda. Why is Rabbi Yehuda Pasach B'chol Makom? It's also the Iker sugya of Pnim Yisatora is how to elevate Malchus, how to bring Malchus, how to bring Shekhinah, how to bring this lowly world back up to its supernal source and to uncover the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu's unity. So the preemptive experience that leads to the entire encounter of Rashbi in the cave is Rabbi Yehuda starting to speak. Because it's the Indian of His Eurus HaMalchus. 
when the Shechina HaKadosha, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants his Kavod to be revealed, there's a Hisairus. And that Hisairus very often leads to the to the, the Hefkerus and the chaos that we're going to see in this Gemara. But the motivating factor is Vayihi of Ba'aretz, and there was a hunger in the land. Zakta Ariza, what's Aretz? Aretz is also Malchus. Aretz is Malchus. It's nothing of its own, but there's a rumbling desire for Aretz to be elevated. And that drives and that becomes the force behind what we're going to find is really this Gemara on Daf Lam and Gimel and Bamem Adlikin is the origin story of the Zohar HaKadosh, right? This is where Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai stops being the regular Tana in Torah Sanigla, which he is, right? Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was a Vada Tana, Right, he's 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 nechshav as a fundamental tana, but in no way is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai praised to such a degree in in the Gemara in revealed Torah in a way that is 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 so questionable in relationship to other tanaim. Sure, there's there's a few makomos yachalani lip Torah minadin, right? So there's hints, right? Or harbu asuk Rabbi Shimon velo hitzlichu. But there are Rabbi Shimon was praised. When you look in the Zayir Hakadosh. The hero of the entire Zohar Kadosh is Rabbi Shimon Rayochai. The book of the Zohar is a book about Rabbi Shimon. It's about the Butsina de Nuhura, the, the pillar of fire. And, and the Rabbi Shimon that you see in the Zohar is very different than the Rabbi Shimon that you see in, in Talmud Bavli and Talmud Yerushalmi. The Nazir Kadosh, Rav David Kohn points out in his Kol Anavua, that Be'emes it's not true because the whole Svara, the Svara that you find in Rabbi, in Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai always is that the Koyach is Nechshav is Poel. That Chashav Lizro Kizarab Gami. Or Mitzvah Surichos Kavana. Or Dorshin Taima Dekra. Meaning the idea that there is an inner content that is identifiable with the external manifestation. Right? That something does not need to manifest in a practical way in order to be considered real. The Koyach is also Nechshav. Machshava is also a real thing. He sees, as in the language of the Nazir, I'm paraphrasing, he sees that which stands to be revealed in the future as already existing. And that is the secret of Rabbi Shimon and the Zohar as well. So the Svar of Rabbi Shimon from one place to the other is very clear. And he learned this from Rabbi Akiva. But the celebration of Rabbi Shimon is very different in the Zohar Kaddish. And I heard Mipeh of Matul Zilber Shlita, and this is based on a teaching of Rabbi Nachman, that the real difference is the Chavraya that Rabbi Shimon had. That in the, in, in the Gemara, Rabbi Shimon had Rabbi Elazar. He had his son, which is the biggest Indian in the world. There's a girsa. There's a girsa about Rabbi Shimon that Zachaman de Ayel Venafak, Bar Benafak. Right? Praiseworthy is the one who went up and descended, who went inside and outside. And it implies, as the Nazir Kaddish points out, that Rabbi Akiva was Nichnas B'Shalom V'Yatza B'Shalom. After this Gemara, Bezra Hashem, we'll go to, to Chagiga, and we're going to start learning in Mirza Hashem Perik, uh, Perik in Dorshan, I think, with the permission of the Rav. <coughs> but, in, in ba- so, so there's a Girsa, Rav Itchemeyer has been pointing this out, that Ayul Bar doesn't only mean that he went in and out, he went up with his son. Ayel Ubar, meaning the Darga of Rabbi Shimon was that he was a tzaddik and that his son was going to be a tzaddik ben tzaddik. Meaning the capacity of a tzaddik to be so elevated but still so engaged with, with his child. And so Rabbi Shimon always had this. Rabbi Shimon always had this, right? I, I believe, I, I don't know, but I could be wrong, but I think Rabbi Shimon says, you know, if there were 30 tzaddikim, they could be poiter as the oilam and adin, but if there weren't, then it would just be me and you. I don't know if he goes down to a place where it's just him. It could be that it's just him. But it could be that he's always referring to him and Rabbi Elazar together because the koyach of Rashbi, the koyach of a tzaddik, is really very much dependent upon those who are receiving it. And in the Zayar HaKadosh, Rav Matul Zilber said, he had a chavraya. He had a chavraya that knew the value of what Rashbi was saying, who understood who Rashbi was. And the Mela, if you have a chavraya who are pushing you, you have a chavraya who are kind of ma'ira a person, so then you become like Rashbi. Then Rashbi becomes the butzina de Nehoira. Rashbi becomes the, the tzadik yisad o'ilam. But that's true for anybody. The Beis Yisrael says, what does it mean? What does it mean? Haba l'tayr m'sayin oso? Somebody who comes and has a desire towards holiness, that they help him from Shemayim. M'sayin oso ayidei chevratot. The help comes about by way of healthy social interactions, of people to be around, people who appreciate you for what you do. As Rapputner points out in the first Maimar on Purim, the secret of Koya Chahilul. What your Mahalel, a person who's Mahalel their friend, is Ma'ura their friend. Like Rabbi Nachman says that by being Dan Saman Lachafskus, you're Be'emes Malo Oysam Lachafskus. They feel better about themselves. Why? Because you're enabling them to feel better about themselves. So the Chiddush of the Zohar, and 
it used to be that we only studied, and I mean that most people only studied the content of the Sefer HaZohar, the Drushim of the Zohar, the Kabbalah of the Zohar, or the Drushim of the Zohar. But a renaissance has taken place, and it's a renaissance that the Tzadikim always knew about. But there's a renaissance that's taken place in particular through what can be referred to as the scholarship of the Zohar. There, there's always been a history of Zoharic scholarship, right? Authorship of the Zohar. These were important questions to tzaddikim as well. These were always important questions. What's amazing about this and about the whole Indian of Rashbi in general is that typically with an academic subject, a person begins with a lack of clarity, of uncertainty, and they move towards a level of certainty. So it's caught up in the hypothetical myths, and then a person seems to come to a place of clarity. With the understanding of the book of the Zohar, it's Adra Ibcha Mastabra. It started with an absolute claim that the Zohar is written by somebody other than Rashbi. That was like the Halacha Psukha by, by them. And then Mamela, what that field itself has moved to is that now, after all is said and done and every element of research has been done, they're no longer even sure what to call this thing. Now the question is not who wrote this, but like what is this universe? What is this thing referred to as the Zohar? It's impossible to define on any level. Whether you can call it a book or not, it's more than a book. It's a reality. And so it's gone from the total opposite. It's gone from certainty of denial into a place of having absolutely no idea. The Baal HaSulam famously, it's one of my favorite teachings, I think. The Baal HaSulam wrote at, at the end of the Hakdama of his parish on the Zohar, he wrote... He says, and with regards to the, the mechker that's going on nowadays, he says, BMS, you know, this has never really bothered me. But I read, I read what you wanted me to read, he says, and, um, and I'll tell you what I think. He says, if it was proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that Rav Moshe de Leon, the Mukubal the, Eloki, the, right, the, the, the tzaddik, Rav Moshe de Leon, that he wrote the Zohar, what would that mean? It would mean that he's bigger than Rashbi. He says, because BMS, I'm not even satisfied by the notion that Rashbi wrote the Zohar. I'm, I'll be satisfied when I find out that one of the Memchas Nevi'im wrote the Zohar. And he says, Adra, but that doesn't satisfy me. The only way I'll be satisfied is if it's proven beyond the shadow of a doubt that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote the Zohar Kadosh. So he says, you know, who wrote it, where it came from? It's the light of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So it's an amazing thing. And one of the things that is coming out from this space, instead of studying the content of the Zohar, the teachings of the Zohar, there's the narrative framing of the Zohar which is quite possibly the most heartbreakingly beautiful kind of, I believe, content available in, in Torah. The, the stories before, after, and in the middle of the Chavraya revealing the secrets of the Zohar. Rapil Zeitlin spoke profoundly, intoxicatingly beautiful about this idea. And the Soedi Sharm touches upon it, the Atarasi of Zidichav does, that every gesture that Atana has in the Zohar Kadosh is demanding of study. But the Zohar Kadosh is a book that is revealed along a path at nighttime in the northern hills of Yushalayim. There's encounters with strangers on every corner, donkey drivers carrying secrets, expressions of desire, expressions of friendship, expressions of love, expressions of connectivity, of disunity. And, and instead of seeing it as fodder that leads to one teaching after the other, in truth, it's now been understood or is beginning to be understood as as fundamental to the teachings as themselves. In fact, this could be the true teaching. It's a book of friendship. The Sefer HaZohar is a book of being with the Hevra, walking around, talking in Torah, being silent together, supporting one another, of having identifiable goals, shared goals towards a hischabris to holiness and a willingness to get up in the morning. Meaning, the Zohar is always saying, like, and they got up in the middle of the night, and then I wandered. Why are you telling me all of these different preemptive gestures? Elama, that's the Iker Sod. The Iker Sod is that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai and his Chavaya Kadisha were human beings who were walking along a path in the land of Eretz Yisrael. And, they were, and it was nighttime, and they were afraid. And when they were afraid, they said they were afraid. And when they heard wind bustle through the trees, they're like, what was that? And they were sad and excited. And, and so the, the, the secret of Rabbi Shimon on a certain level is the light of his Chavras, is the secret of Chavraya. And that's why Rabbi Shimon is spoken about so differently in the Zara Kadosh than he is um, in a revealed way. But here, even the origin story is Rabbi Shimon sitting with Chavra. The Maisa Biyavna is Rabbi Shimon sitting with Chavra. He always was with Chavra. The Yasve, they were sitting, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yoisi, Rabbi Shimon. They were all sitting together. They were sitting, sitting. The Yasve, Yehuda ben Gerim. And Yehuda ben Gerim sat down, Gabayim. Pasach, Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda opens up and says, Kama na'im ma'asehen shal umazu. 
how no, how wondrous, how pleasant, how valuable are the actions of this nation. Tiknu shukim, tiknu gesharim, tiknu marchatzos. They developed shukim, they developed marketplaces, they developed bridges, and they developed a place of cleansing. Right. So again, these three tikkunim over here, there's many ways to see it, but, but a shuk is a place where a person sustains the body. It's where you partake in physical necessity, of buying, of going back and forth from the shuk. It's the experience of being in this world. A gesher is the interconnection between one stage and another stage. The marchatzos is a place where a person is cleansing themselves of their body. Right, where a person is preparing themselves for the rechitza, for the kedusha, for the tara that it takes to go into the next world. So again, Rabbi Yehuda was not praising the Romans in a revealed way. In a revealed way, that's what he was saying. But the amkus, what Rabbi Yehuda is identifying here, are these three things that this ummah is helping us understand are the shukim, the experience in life, the gesher between life and what comes afterwards of being a ben oilam haba or drawing oilam haba into oilam haza, as we've spoken about, which is shayach to the marchatzos. The whole Indian of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, the whole, the whole light of Rabbi Shimon is, is this Indian of clarifying the sugya of, of Misa, right? Of the transition from the Shuk through the Gesher to the place of the Merchats where a person is cleansing themselves of a body that needed to partake. The whole light of Rabbi Shimon, what is the apex of this Gemara as we're going to see? After Rabbi Shimon is saved from everything, after everything is good, Rabbi Shimon, like Yaakov Avinu, like he learns in this week's Parsha, Rabbi Shimon says, Kevan de Israchu Shneis, because the Nase happened, let me go fix something. He learns this from Yaakov Avinu, who after the Pegisha with the Malach of Esav, he goes to be Metakain, either a coin or to create, uh, or to create kind of homes for people. So Rabbi Shimon comes and says, what needs fixing? And what do they say to him? They said, there's a Suffolk Tumas Misa in Tiveria. There's a place where the Kohanim don't know where they're able to go. And Rashbi comes along and he's tired here Tiveria. Oso Zakin comes along and says, Rashbi, you're Matahir Misa, making fun of him. And Rashbi's like, you're still around. So the whole Indian of Rashbi, of Tzadok HaKoyin Meleblin says, the Nakuda that a person is made fun of, the Nakuda that a person gets poked on the most, is in truth the Nakuda that they have to be Matakin. So one can say that if this Hahu Oso Ish comes along and says to Rashbi, Rashbi, what, you're clarifying the world from death? Be'emes, that's what Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is doing. The whole Indian of Rabbi Shimon is the death that the, the death that is survived by life, meaning the life that moves beyond its own its own destruction. Life continues, Chaim continues. Ah, forgetfulness, death, which Shichcha is Misa. No, no forgetfulness, no death. That's the Koyach of Rashbi to be Goyzer that I, I can be Poitras the Oylem and Hadin. So this Indian that the conversation begins with is how do I transition from the shukim through the gesher into the merchats of life, of engagement with the body, through the transition away from the body. This is the sugya that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is coming to be mevarer. As we're going to see, the whole Indian of Sisrei Torah is, is the question of, of how, does, how does life come out of endings? How does, how does light come out of what we conceive to be darkness? Rabbi Yossi Shatak Rabbi Yossi was silent. Ne'ene Rashbi ve'amar kol ma'ashe tiknu lo'i tiknu elu l'tzarech atzman. Rashbi says, no, no, no. Everything they've done, they've only done for themselves. They've only done for themselves. Tiknu shukim l'hashiv behem zainers. Marchatzos la'aden behem atzman. Gesharim lito mehem mechas. So, Rabbi Shimon over here is, is, is not necessarily arguing with with Rabbi Yehuda, the metzias of their behaviors is their metzias, right? There's no question here as to what the motivation behind Romi was. Romi is Esav, Romi is Edom, Romi represents that last exile, that place of real struggle. So obviously, obviously everything that takes place in reality is in Hagas HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Everything. There's nothing that happens in reality that is not completely subsumed by, surrounded by, driven by, and sustained by the annihilating light of a Kaddish Baruch Hu's Ratzon to make that thing happen at that very moment. Whether you're learning Bitachon and Ashkacha Pratis Alfi the Baal or whether you're learning it through the Rambam. Kuli Amalokli. It's a question of, not semantics, it's much more than semantics, it's a question of mechanisms of connection, awareness, contemplation, but nobody disagrees that a Kaddish Baruch is everything. It's just a question of accessibility to such an idea, relevancy of such an idea, but everybody agrees that Hashem is here, Hashem is there. 
Hashem is truly everywhere, right? So the question is, what value do these people get for the ultimate light that comes out of their behaviors? Question of, of, of Mitzrayim as well. And Paro, the Baal Shem Tov talks about this. Meaning, the good is going to come out, the good is going to come out of their behaviors. So as Rabbi Yud is saying, maybe we should don those things, l'chafschus, Maybe because the sof is going to be good, we can elevate the process that led to it in spite of the fact that it appeared negative. And, and Rabbi Shimon is saying absolutely not. Everything that's going to happen is going to be dependent on the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but a person has to be able to see Ra, Oyave Hashem, Sinura. The shita of Rabbi Yehuda is a shita that says if ultimately everything is going to be good, then everything is going to be good and they shouldn't be punished. That's I mean, a dark. That, that was Rabbi Schoenberg of Chayzak, the philosophy pre the cave. You know what I'm saying? That's the, that's pre the, the cave and after the cave also. Process. Pre the cave and after the cave also. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai did not become more lenient after the cave. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai understood the secret of being a tzaddik. That Yochal Ani lived to Rasa'ilim Hadin. Rabbi Shimon did not stop seeing the world with strict severity. God forbid. It wasn't more of like a, an openness to, or a permissiveness. Rabbi Shimon realized that. The, the koyach of a tzaddik, the tzaddik in us and the tzaddik in reality, is that ein hadavar tolei elabi. Ein hadavar tolei elabi. What am I going to spend my time judging somebody else's behaviors when so for me everything is dependent? Like, you know, what? Like, or like, a, like in this in this Gemara and also like in other Gemaras and Prophets. That he's ma'am mitzchus. Yeah. Sure, but that's the avoid of a tzaddik. It doesn't mean that Rabbi Shimon stopped seeing things with the strict no, severity. Right, right, no, absolutely, absolutely. Your point is very well taken. The distinction is absolutely clear. The distinction between before the cave and after the cave is clear. But Rabbi Shimon still had the same. This is Lashitas Rabbi Shimon. Rabbi Shimon is saying, no, the fact that Yichar Hashem is going to be Neskala in the end doesn't mean that we give some inherent value to the negativity that brought it about. Rabbi Yehuda is saying, yes. Rabbi Yehuda, David Melech wanted to reveal such a light that Bikesh David Lavoid of Adazara, right? Bikesh David Lalis Al Rosh, the Gemara says Bikesh Lavoid of Adazara. Why? On a certain level, because A, he wanted to show the, teach, the, the power of Tshuva, and B, David Amelach knew that there's nothing but Hashem. There's nothing but Hashem. That's the Dark of Mashiach Ben Yosef, of Mashiach Ben David. There's nothing but Hashem. Even Rome, even Edom, can be seen and judged favorably. Rabbi Shimon is rooted in a place of severity. He was a Malach of Aish. Right? It, it's an Eish that's Yared Men Shemayim. It's Bar Yochai. It's, uh, and again, Rabbi Shimon is associated with Shmiya, with severity. Rabbi Shimon is saying, no, no, no. You're right. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is everything. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is everywhere. Everything is rooted in and, and contingent upon that. But that doesn't give a person, if a person attempts to, to see the good in it, to uncover that Nitzutz of Tov that's hidden within the Ra prior to the arrival of Mashiach, so it's a slippery slope. Right? The Arizal explains Mufurish by the mitzvah of Shikhrus Purim that Purim is the only moment, the only moment where a person is armed with the spiritual power when done properly to engage in this avoida that Rabbi Yehuda is describing of, of being melamid schus on Edom, of, of saying, bar, you know, not knowing the difference. And it has to be in a state of Shikhrus because you can't do it rationally. A person who begins to descend into that place gets stuck. And so, and my favorite thing about this is then you have Rabbi Yossi who's shoytik. So you see this in the question of Yediyah and Bechira as well, right? That the Rambam says one thing and, and the, the Ravid says you should have been quiet. And the MS, it's, it's the answer to the question comes from both places. It's from speaking and being quiet. You can't answer, you can't answer the question of Yediyah and Bechira except by speaking and being silent at the same time. Chash and Mal. Almost as if shtaik kach Allah b'machshava. You can speak all you want about it as long as you come to a place of silence. So the Raivan and the Rambam both reveal that the answer to the question of Yediyah and Bechira is, is Dibor and Shtika at once. And, and then you see this over here also with Rabbi Yehuda and Rabbi Yossi that Rabbi Yehuda speaks. Rabbi Yossi is silent because he's not denying the Shita of Rabbi Yehuda. He's not denying the fact that, yeah, Taka Epes, you know, everything is clearly HaKadosh Baruch Hu, so maybe we can say Kamen Na'eh, how beautiful is it? So, but he's silent, and, and from that Pegisha, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is able to say, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai is able to say that, you know, um, I, I'm not agreeing with this, we're not going to identify that positive Nitzos yet. And like you're saying, 
the, the process of Rabbi Shimon allowing and teaching us how to do this safely and properly without the fear, the threat of falling into the mistakes of Rabbi Yehuda or the Avoida of Yehuda, which is a Yerida, Gedola very often. It, it's the union between Mashiach ben Yosef and Mashiach ben David. And so we're going to see, as we learn this Gemara, how the two of them unify, Bez Rosh Hashem. Can we relate any of this to Rav Kook? Uh, not I. <laughs> Rav Kook was the Tzadik Yisrael Olam. I mean, I mean the, the, the Lima Schools versus... The... Oh, yeah, Bevadai, uh, Bevadai, I think. And meaning not... Klal Gadol, by, Klal Gadol, I believe, by Rav Avram Yitzchak Kohen Kook, Schools of Yogan and Lima, the Kohen Gadol, is that Rav Kook, Rav, Rav Kook is so big... Rav Kook is so big that he does not need anybody to support him. That Rav Kook's value, Rav Kook's ore, is not dependent on, on the acceptance or the acknowledgement of anybody. But Rav Kook demanded, Rav Kook would not daven mariv. Rav Kook would not daven mariv until the kanoi who threw sewage on his head was, was, was bailed out by his own money. That being said... Historically speaking, the limud schus that Rav Kook was involved in to such a, a profound degree is certainly identifiable with, with a hanhaga of Yehuda, which only sees good even in places where that good is just kind of still stuck. So I think it's, it's not something that I, you know, I feel comfortable. I have nothing to say on the matter, but, but certainly I, I think it's possible to say. Ezra Sashem. Okay, Chavra.